Hello everyone, I want to show you a game from the Zurich uh, tournament in 1953, the famous candidates tournament, um, from which one of the greatest chess books of all time uh, was produced, which is called the Zurich 1953 by David Bronstein, and uh, I highly recommend that book to any student or fan of chess. Now, this game uh, took place in round five of that tournament um between Hungary, hungarian uh grandmaster uh laszlo sabo and uh with the black pieces it was uh the author of the book uh david bronstein uh who just a few years earlier in 1950 had challenged uh mikhail botvinik for the world chess championship so bronstein was uh one of the elite soviet uh chess players at the time and actually in that match uh i said 1950 i'm sorry uh, 1951 uh, he challenged botvinik and in that match he actually drew uh 12 games apiece uh, so he never became world champion but he was uh very close and at this time uh, he was still a very strong player definitely um in the top five in the world uh, still at the time so bronstein had the black pieces um, for those of you who are not familiar with Bronstein, he was a very uh, creative player. Um, if we look at chess as art and science, we could say that Bronstein uh, leaned towards the artistic end of things. Very creative and imaginative, imaginative uh, player. Now, let's get into the game. So, again, um, Sabu has the white pieces. And he started off the game with d4. Bronstein responded knight of six, c4, and d6. Now, this is uh, known as the old Indian uh, defense. And the difference between the old Indian and the king's Indian uh, defense proper is that black will thin kettle his bishop in the king's Indian defense on g6. So, for example, Play could continue, let's say, knight c3, g6, and, sorry about that, uh, e4, and bishop g7. And you have a king's Indian defense. Notice, again, the position of the uh, bishop uh, on g7. The old Indian, the bishop, the dark square bishop, will end up on e7. So, for example... Knight c3, knight bd7, let's say knight f3, e5 for example, e4, you can see the bishop is on e7. So the uh, old Indian has the reputation of being very solid, right, but a bit uh, passive. So it's not a bad opening, it's not refuted or anything like that. It's just that uh, modern players uh, believe that there's more uh, possibilities for the black side in playing the King's Indian and uh, Fiend Kettling that bishop on uh, G7. But nevertheless, this opening is very solid and uh, it has the benefits of not having tons of theory associated with it. So it is a great opening to pick up uh, if you don't have um, you know, eight hours a day to study uh, the uh, different variations in the King's Indian uh, defense. OK, so you're not going to get a uh, you know spectacular uh, position with the black pieces full of dynamic possibilities, but you will get a solid position where you will not get overran and uh, you will have winning chances. You just have to be uh, patient. And when you see your opportunities, of course, you have to uh, you have to uh, uh, be bold enough uh, to take your chances. All right. So back to the game. After D6 from Bronstein, um, Sabu played Knight F3. Now Knight C3 can be played in uh, main lines. Of course, a Knight BD7, and um, Black is going to play. E5 eventually and 
black can also get away with playing e5 right away and it's been known for a long time that after the trade of queens that black is okay all right white will have some temporary initiative but after several moves black usually will wind up uh, putting his king somewhere on c7 after moves like c6 and um this is the reason why most grandmasters against e5 will opt to keep the tension on the board and play a move like knight f3 instead another option is bishop f5 this is known as uh the Yanofsky variation and uh, was brought into um, top level practice by uh, David Yanofsky uh, I believe in the 19 uh, 20s and the idea is very simple and straightforward of course and that is to prevent the early e4 uh, from white so you'll get games whereby white will play f3 and of course expand uh, in this fashion with e4 and drive the bishop uh, back but um, this also uh, has a solid uh, reputation um, and it's something that you should look into if you're uh, interested in this opening. In our game, after a d6, uh, Sabu went with this line, um, knight f3. Now, after knight bd7, uh, the game pretty much transposes into lines where knight c3 was played at the beginning. However, for the enterprising player, you can play bishop g4 here. All right, that's possible. But most players will just simply keep it simple and play knight bd7, right? Instead of having to learn the ideas behind another uh, line altogether. And this is what Bronstein did. He just played knight bd7. And here, um, Sabu played g3. Of course, knight c3 is possible. Um, Bronstein responded with e5. And bishop g2 was played. Bronstein played c6 here. And what's the idea here behind c6? All right. When black is playing c6 in his variation, he's he's trying to set up um, d5 and e4 advances. So, for example, let's give black a few moves so you can just see the idea. So I'm not going to make any moves for white. I'm just going to give black a few moves in a row. So, for example, c6, black would like to play, um, say, for instance, e takes d4. And let's say if queen takes d4, you know, then he can play d5 right here. c takes d5, bishop c5, queen d3, and knight takes d5. And you can see how black has um, gotten his pieces out and he's pretty much equalized uh, right away. If... Again, e takes d4, and if knight takes d4, which is, you know, I think what most players would choose, knight e5, attacking the c pawn, and let's say, for example, b3, protecting it, then again, d5, and uh, black is doing very uh, well in this position. Of course, remember, for demonstration purposes, I've given black a few extra moves. In this same variation, if knight e5, and if just knight d2, protecting the pawn with the piece, then again, d5. All right, so just remember, the main idea behind a move like c6 is uh, d5. Other ideas that are possible um, that black will do is, after c6, he will play, you know, when given opportun opportunity, of course, he will play e4, and then d5 and then you have this this pawn chain here so these are uh ideas behind the move c6 and of course another idea is also to allow the queen to come out to the queen side sometimes the b6 sometimes the a5 and the third idea behind the move c6 too is sometimes for black to play on the queen side um following up with the move a6 and b5 challenging the c4 pawn and weakening the white center so there is a lot behind that um seemingly innocuous move c6 but back to the game 
Sabu played Bishop G2. And Bronstein played C6. All right. And of course, White has moves too. So uh, Sabu is not really trying to uh, allow these plans into fruition. Of course, he could have castled here, but he decides to uh, throw a bit of a monkey wrench in there. And he plays D takes E5 here. And D takes E5. But if you look at the position, you can see that, you know what? Um, White releasing the tension like that doesn't really do too much for his position. And uh, Black uh, black is uh, pretty comfortable uh, here. Okay? Uh, and I want to share with you Bronstein's comments, um, you know, uh, in this position from uh, his own notes. So... Basically, after the move uh, C6 here that we discuss that we t discussed. So in this position right here, Bronstein uh, states the following: White's seemingly irreproachable development turns out to have a hole in it after all. He has failed to take control of E4, and Black exploits this immediately by preparing E5 and E4 and d6 d5 so this is what i was talking about earlier creating that pawn chain in d5 and e4 and c6 sabu prefers to exchange pawns at e5 which is what we just saw but this gives black an easy game and he begins at once to lay plans to assume the initiative so that's david bronstein's own uh comments there so again after this exchange it doesn't really do too much uh, for white here Also possible, of course, for blacks, knight takes e5 here, and knight takes e5, d takes, and again, black doesn't have anything to worry about uh, in this end game. So moving on, so castles, bishop c5, knight c3, castles. And now queen c2. And again, black has a fine position. So black has equalized out of the uh, opening here. And again, let me just give you some uh, moves that, um, you know, will fall into a typical plan for black here. So black wants to play queen e7, right? He wants to get this bishop out also and connect his rooks. So a good idea here, knight b6, right, attacking this pawn. White has to defend somehow, of course, b3. h6 is a good move, preventing this pin here. And also, more importantly, uh, making sure this knight is free from harassment so that this, this uh, pawn advance can be supported. Right, this pawn push. So this is why white would play, say, e4, rook d8, queen c2, and bishop g4. So this would be like a typical, um, you know, plan for black as far as uh, developing his pieces. And, of course, he could play like rook d7 and then uh, rook a d8. And then eventually um, move that knight from b6 back in, uh, back into the fray. Right via say C8 or a D7, uh, depending on uh, what White is doing on the other side of the board. But this will be like a typical uh, setup in this um, this particular position after White has exchanged in the center like he did. So back to the game again. Sabu played Queen C2. Bronstein played Queen E7, and now Knight H4. Uh, from Sabu and we can see that um, Black has some ideas of going um, to F4 and uh, F5 excuse me White has some ideas of attacking on F5 and um, Black has to be mindful of these things and be uh, be careful here all right so um, here Bronstein played Rook E8 now, I like, personally, knight b6. Again, sticking with that plan that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it also prevents this move um, from black. I mean, he could do it, but then you, you could just uh, snatch off the uh, the knight here. 
Uh, Rook E8 is a good move, but very provocative. And what um, Bronstein is doing is just supporting this pawn and, you know, threatening to advance at some point, right? And attack um, white right down uh, the center here. All right. Now, again, let me share with you the idea of Bronstein from his own notes. So he plays Rook E8 here. And then after Rook E8, Knight A4 was played. Now, if Knight F5, Black can just play Queen E6. Again, attacking his pawn. B3 and E4. This is possible. So, again, the danger wasn't such where Bronstein felt like he needed to move the Knight to B6. And this is why uh, he, did, he didn't uh, wind up moving. And... Sabo agreed because he didn't play knight f5. Instead, he played knight f knight a4 going after the bishop. So knight a4, let me share with you again uh, Bronstein's words here that I believe are important. Okay, so he, he writes, in the present instance, the pivotal factor is the pawn at e5. With the support of the rook and queen, it may easily advance to e3. To counteract this, White tries to disorganize the enemy ranks by carrying out flanking raids with his cavalry. Black decides not to waste time retreating the bishop since the exchange on c5 would develop his knight to a good position and uncover his queen's bishop as well. Black's move also cuts off the retreat at f3 from the white king's knight. All of these advantages are more than enough compensation for the, in air quotes, sacrifice of his indian bishop so in other words bronstein is like hey i don't mind giving up this bishop on c5 because of all the benefits that i'm going to get as a result he's saying hey white's gonna spend some time capturing this bishop my knight will come to a powerful square my bishop that's blocked in will uh be released and also this advance of this pawn to e4 is going to hinder this knight from being able to come back. So this is uh, Bronstein's uh, thought process. Okay. So after knight a4, he played e4. And now uh, Sabu played knight f5. Now, of course, knight takes e5, knight takes c5 is possible. And, um, you know, white could play b4, I guess, and try to kick the knight off. You know, and uh, of course, this will block this bishop. So perhaps a move. Sorry about that. Perhaps this move knight a6. Good idea. But then the knight again had to be replaced, uh, repositioned at some point. All right. This knight, of course, would probably go to bishop e6. Uh, e6 rather. And um, the game continues. However, Sabu played natural move knight f5 and... Bronstein played queen e5. Bishop h3. Now he decides, you know what? I'm going to preserve this bishop. Bishop d2. Queen went back to c7. And, of course, you have to be tactically alert here. Um, I should have mentioned this... Uh, when it happened, so after, of course, Bishop H3, right, um, keeping our, uh, protection on this knight here, um, you know, the, there's a the, this simple threat of Bishop uh, F4 here, so you don't want to uh, get caught caught uh, out there like that. So Bishop F8 is played, and this is this is why, so that now the queen will have uh, an escape square. So if bishop f4, then now queen a5. It's possible, and the queen, the queen is okay. So if the queen, if the bishop stays here now, then bishop f4, and then the queen, you know, the queen runs into some difficulties. So bishop f8, bishop d2, queen gets out of dodge, Bishop g2, and now g6, and now Sabu plays knight e3, 
Um, when I first saw this, looked at this game, um, I was thinking knight h6. That's more natural, and black is forced to give up this bishop. So I think this is a better move because, after all, the king can't really, um, you know, the king can't go here because of uh, f7, the f7 square. So it's either bishop takes, bishop takes, and let's say queen a5, for example. And I like this for white. You know, white is not winning, but still, this is better for white. And the other idea is just trying to come up with the king to g7. And you can play bishop f4 here, or maybe uh, bishop e3, and maybe trying to end up on d4 uh, somehow. Anyway, Sabu played knight e3 here. And now, Bronstein returned and played queen e5. All right. So, what's Bronstein's plan at this point? So, his his plan is to... I'm sorry, um, not Bronstein's plan, but what's White's plan? Because I've went over some ideas for black already. So, Sabu's plan is basically... As you, you might have picked up already, he's attacking this e-pawn. This e-pawn is very strong and very annoying. So, White's plan is definitely uh, to, uh, uh, you know, based around attacking this e-pawn. But he has a second plan also. And that plan is to expand on the queen side. That's another plan that exists in this position. Is that um, uh, Black is, is strong on the king side. So, Black... Um, uh, definitely in this particular position wants to build up, you know, in the center around this E pawn and, um, try to attack on the king side of the board, whereas white wants to neutralize the strength of the E pawn and attack on the opposite wing, which is the queen side. So again, if I could give white some extra moves here, we could play moves like rook FD1, A3, bishop C3, B4. All right, bishop d4, for example, and knight c3. All right, notice the build up against the pawn here and the expansion on the queen side. A nice little plan for white. All right, so back to the game. After Bronstein plays queen e5, Sabo plays f5, excuse me, f4. So what he does is he puts Bronstein, he gives Bronstein the dilemma here. Now, Bronstein can stop this queenside expansion by simply uh, giving up the e-pawn by playing en passant. And this will be a good move. However, as chess players, sometimes we get stuck on and focused on a certain idea and theme. So, psychologically, it might be very difficult for Bronstein at this point to play a move like en passant because his whole game has revolved around holding on to this e-pawn and using it um, as a wedge against the uh, white king side, all right? So correct here would be a move like e takes. There would be nothing wrong with that, all right? But it's at this point, it's more of like a psychological um, blow to relinquish this pawn. And this is how play could go, for example. D8. And again, if we were to give Black another extra move, this is how his play would look. You know, he would just he'd be dominating uh, in the center. All right, after exchanges the pawn. So Bronstein, sticking to his, his guns, he, he played the move Queen H5. So therefore, he's attacking this pawn, right, which is unprotected. And he maintains the wedge in the position. All right, so that's a move I think a lot of us would play. And I think queen h5 is a good move. I just want to show you that there's alternate al al alternate plans in the position. It depends on your style, right? So I think most players would have, you know, stuck with Bronstein's idea and just try to, um, you know, keep that pawn on e4. And that's what he did. Play continue h3, and 
this was this move was interesting uh by uh Sabu. Uh he doesn't he doesn't try to protect the pawn. I mean you know, at the rook F F E one, you know, knight B six, for example. Black black is okay. Black is, you know, well well on his way. All right. To uh, attacking um uh black. Excuse me, attacking white. So for example, if Rook F E one is played, then right black is unleashed in his plan, right? So he plays knight b six, for example, bishop c three. It's just a sample variation, and you can see the attack right on the king side. And this forces uh white's hand. Knight takes g four, bishop takes g four, and let's say knight b six, a takes b four, b five, and you can see black has good position, initiative going, say a3, c5, and black just has, you know, open doors to, right, to keep attacking. Let's say bishop takes e4, and I'm just playing some moves to give you an idea of what, you know, both sides are trying to do here. Let's say queen takes b4, and now you can see um, black is almost winning here if not winning here you see this double attack here on this bishop and let's say if rook takes then you can see this rook is hanging right here so that's a losing move right there for uh white let's say if uh bishop d3 right you gotta try to preserve material then rook takes a1 rook takes a1 and queen d4 check and of course, the weakness on the dark squares rears its ugly head, and the rook is lost. And let's say queen d3, then just same thing, rook a d8, and then this bishop will drop. So you can see just in that little sample variation that black, um, you know, is putting a lot of pressure if white is not careful here. And this is, um, you know, just a sample, just a taste of why uh, Sabu say, you know what? I I don't have time to worry about this pawn on e2 right now. So he just simply played h3, preventing this whole idea, knight g4. And so now he says, hey, go ahead, take the pawn. I'm going to use the time against you. So queen takes e2. Now rook a d1, queen d3. So of course, uh, Bronstein rightfully says, "You know what? Um, <laughs> I I snatched this pawn. Now let's go into the let's go into uh, uh, an end game here." All right. Of course, Sabu is saying, "No, nope, I'm not going to trade with you." And Bronstein moves the queen uh, out of the way. G4. And now queen c7. Okay. So, again, I want to turn to Bronstein's uh, notes here in this position. It's pretty cool what he has to say about snatching uh, that pawn there. So, I quote. So, white has made just one useful move. Rook d1. And as far as those king, uh, and as far as those king side pawn moves. Those might better be called double edged than favorable to white. So what he's basically saying, yeah, rook d1 is useful, but the pawn moves not so much because they're double edged. Okay, so yes, they they might be good for attacking black, but white is also weakening his own uh, king side in the process. All right. Um. So then he goes on further to say that, which we might add that black could have still made better use of his pieces with knight c5, knight c3, and now uh, queen d3, all right? And then he says, in that event, black's knight would stand actively on c5, the queen's bishop would have been uncovered, and white's bishop would have been temporarily deprived of the c3 square. So again, he's lamenting the fact that he, you know, didn't play the knight to c5, and he didn't get his uh, c8 bishop uh, out. So he says, what conclusion may we draw from all of this? 
that when one is well developed, one can afford to spend a few moves to capture an important enemy pawn. But bear in mind that one must also evaluate the position correctly and calculate accurately. So, in other words, snatching that pawn on queen e2 with queen e2 was a risky move. All right. But he's saying, hey, if you're de well developed, you got your pieces out, you can do it. But nevertheless, you still got to, you know, uh, be sharp in your calculations. All right. So that's the last thing I'm going to read from uh, Bronstein. And, you know, he has a lot of notes, but I'm not going to just read read all of his notes. Um, but I just wanted to give you a taste of the type of um, uh, conversation in uh, language that he uses in the book. It's not all just like annotations and, uh, you know, uh, just dry, um, you know, uh, uh, lines being given he's actually giving you ideas and thought uh thought uh his thought process that you can take with you and apply it uh later on in your games and this is why i think it's a great book the book is filled with uh you know uh, knowledge you know like that so game continue bishop c3 bishop g7 um so again, white is down a pawn, but black again has to be careful. He plays bishop g7, which is very natural, right? The bishop's on c3. Of course, you want to oppose it on the same diagonal. But again, going back to that accuracy Bronstein was talking about, bishop d6 attacks this pawn uh, right away. All right, so this is a good a good move in this position to fight. Uh, for the initiative for black if g5 then knight h4 and then knight h5 all right it becomes very sharp but these if you're still in pawns you have to be prepared for these kind of uh positions he plays bishop g7 which again is not bad but bishop d6 is a little bit more direct g5 and now b5 so here bronstein starts to lose the, the thread of things a little bit um perhaps better here was just knight h5 again just simply knight h5 and um sorry about that bishop takes g7 knight takes g7 then knight g4 and hey white has some definitely has some compensation here right Dark squares are weak. The knight is going to land on one of these squares sooner or later. Um, but, hey, that's what happens sometimes when you snatch a pawn. So, um, Bronstein, again, he was he justified in taking on E2? Yes. However, like he said, you have to back it up after that, though. You have to be able you have to play accurately after that. And here he starts, he loses the thread a little bit. So, he plays B5. And now G takes F6. Now is he just dropping a piece? No, he 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 he's not um, not making an error that blatant. But he has miscalculated. So Bishop F8. Sabu plays C takes B5. C takes B5. And now Knight D5. And you can see that Black's pieces never uh, they don't get out, right? He he doesn't open up now. We've talked several times already, or Bronstein has, right, about getting the knight to c5, bringing the bishop on c8 out, but look where they're at. They're still in the same places. So what has happened is now is a revolution has started, and the soldiers are still um, not ready. And this is what's going on. Um, White's pieces have become extremely active, and Bronstein's pieces are still, like, on the bench. So queen c5, and now... F5 uh, is played by uh, Sabu. So he's just going for it. Uh, even stronger is uh, probably Queen E3. And even uh, like a move like Rook FE1. And now here if B takes uh, A4, restoring material quality. Then just Bishop takes E4, Queen C5 check. 
bishop d4 and you can see the activity of the pieces even with the queens traded off uh, white is still dominating the position Knight e4 bishop takes e7 bishop takes b7 bishop b4 and white is in the driver's seat all right so back to the game once again f5 by sabo not the strongest move but very um you know intimidating right uh, you know just the pressure you know that is being put on bronstein here is uh palatable bishop b7 and again here uh, it seems like the pressure has gotten the Bronstein here and the wheels fall off. More accurate was just to capture, recapture the piece with uh, B takes A4. But then Knight E7, check, and this creates a forced capture here because the queen is forked. So Bishop takes E7, F takes E7. And if Rook takes E7, then Queen H6 is deadly f6 is forced and f takes g6 that's just a sample line of course um rook takes e7 is not forced maybe black can throw in a move like queen c5 but again the point is white is in control at this point so instead of capturing here bronstein just plays um you know for some development he plays um Bishop to b7 after all where's this knight gonna go so he figures develop and he'll capture this at another time this allows uh Sabu to continue his attack f takes d6 h takes g6 and there's the same idea knight e7 bishop takes e7 f takes e7 and this is really bad open diagonal semi-open h file right white possesses the dark square bishop queen is already on the dark square so this this is looking crazy right now for black bronstein goes into panic mode he plays b4 and here um i don't know if there's time trouble or whatever sabu just simply captures the pawn which is nothing wrong with that but you would think he would just continue the attack um queen takes a4 so Bronstein gets, gets his piece back. Of course, he doesn't um, trade queens. And then Sabu simply played uh, bishop c3. So here, instead of this idea with bishop takes b4, very strong is queen f4 just um, threatening this check right here on f7. And now if b takes c3, queen takes f7 check. King h8 and then rook f4 is brutal with this idea of just coming uh, over to uh h file with the rook so anyway back to the game after B bishop takes b4 queen takes a4 and bishop c3 all right again queen f4 could have been played at this point too with this idea of queen takes f7 he plays b uh bishop to c3 rook takes e7 and this kind of gives life back to Bronstein again, right? The attack is the attack is uh is kind of you know short circuited a little bit, right? In other words, it's not as strong as it could have been. Like I said, after bishops instead of bishop c three, just simply queen f four, and there's really no way for Black to deal with this um this threat of queen takes f seven if um. Let's say f6, for example. If f6, then just rook d7. Very strong. And, and the reason for rook d7, of course, is to remove the protection off of f6. So let's say after either, after either queen takes b4 or... Right, let's get greedy and uh, play queen d7. And just queen takes f6. And, you know, what do you do here? Right, you give up material and lose the game. So queen f4, definitely like the showstopper there. But he played bishop c3. Perhaps he was in some type of time trouble. But this gives Bronstein new life. Rook takes e7 was played. 
And again, the stronger move here was queen to g5 attacking the rook. Queen h6, of course, threatens mate in two ways. But the problem, the problem here is that it's easily parried by knight e5. Right, knight e5 blocks the action of the bishop, so that's it. That's it for the attack. Now, uh, Sabu realizes the error of his ways, and he plays queen g5. See, now he's attacking. So, just imagine if he had played queen g5 right away. That's a little stronger. You see, because now knight e5 can't be played here. So, what would have had to have been played... The move that would have needed to be played here is rook e6, preventing, um, you know, the rook from being captured, of course. And you have like a different, you know, a little bit uh, different outcome here. Now you play a move like queen h6, knight e5, and rook d6, right? And this gives this gives uh, black really, uh, excuse me, white really strong uh, winning chances. So in this particular line, after rook takes e7, queen h6, knight e5, queen g5, it just is not the same. And so basically here, um, Bronstein needs to play rook a e8. However, he plays the move queen e8. And what does queen e8 do? Well, let's go back a move, right? Notice with the queen here, the queen on a4 is keeping the eye on this rook on d1, right? Another thing, whoops, didn't mean to do that. Another thing I want to mention is that the rook is out of the game. So black has been behind the development, you know, for a very, ever since basically he's taken that pawn on e2, he's, he's fallen into difficulties uh, with his development. So it only makes sense to get this final piece into the game. This is attacked. We understand that. So why not bring a piece that has not been active the whole game into the game by playing rook to rook a to e8? That's what makes sense. At the same time, you keep an eye on this rook right here. So for example, rook a e8, and let's say rook d8. Okay. Rook e6. And what's the again, what's the idea behind rook d8 here? Like the idea is if rook takes here, then then queen takes e7 with this double, actually triple attack on the bishop, rook, and knight. So that's the idea there. So black won't take there. So rook e6. Let's say rook takes. Queen takes. And now rook to f5. Knight d7 and queen h4 threatening mate. That's kind of like the last frontier, but then you could just play f6 here. Bishop takes, knight takes, rook takes, king g7. Rook f1 and queen f2. And amazingly, black is able to fend off uh, the attack. Okay? And, um, you know, Black is black is safe. It, the position looks, you know, looks wild, but black black is actually uh, safe in this position. Now, what happened in the game? And again, it, it might have been as a result of time trouble. Bronstein doesn't really mention that in his uh, notes there. So, um, at the queen g five, queen e eight is played. Now, notice the pressure is taken off of this uh, rook here. Now, why do I keep mentioning that? Because of white's next move. Now, he plays rook f4. Notice, if the queen was still on a4, this rook would be hanging. He wouldn't even, He wouldn't be able to do that. So, rook f4. What's the idea behind rook f4? Again, simple. Rook h4 and queen f6. And mating on h8. That's the idea. So, what happens here? Rook f4. Bronstein plays rook c8. It doesn't do anything to stop the plan of black. Rook h4. And now he plays rook takes c3. He makes this sacrifice. And Bronstein misses and, and uh, Sabu miss, both miss mate in three at this point. And Sabu plays queen h6. 
course it looks very strong. However, he had to play queen f6. This is this is correct. Cuz queen f6 def, um takes away any defenses involving moving this f pawn to f5 or f6. And of course allowing the rook to uh protect the um seventh rank. That's why queen f6 is stronger. So for instance, after queen f6, mate is forced Knight f3, bishop takes, e takes, and there's no stopping rook h8 or queen h8. Instead, Sabu played queen h6, which allowed the defense from Bronstein. Bronstein played f6, but actually stronger than f6. Actually stronger than f6 was probably the move f5. And this seems to also uh, save the game for Bronstein, but Bronstein played the move F6. And after F6, Sabu played Bishop to, uh, I'm sorry, B takes C3, natural move. Even stronger than that, amazingly. And it, it's funny because there were so many missed moves here. Rook D6 is super strong here. And you might be saying, wait a minute, uh, can you just capture this Rook? Yes, but... After rook d6, let's say rook c1. This is the problem with the move f6. Is rook d6 coming to the 6 is able is challenging right here. And you'll see. So let's say he preserves his rook with the c1 check. Okay. And of course, black could just... I mean, white... You know, the idea is if white does that, then knight f3... I mean, the game gets super sharp. And this is actually good for black after bishop takes... And E takes here. All right. This threat right here is very strong. And white will have to like start retreating. This is why, you know, then black will play rook E2. And game gets like super sharp here. And these lines would uh, end in black's favor. Right. The white king is just too exposed at this point. This is why in this variation that the rook C1 check. White is not going to capture this rook. Instead, he just moved the king to h2. And, and uh, white will still be winning here. Let's say rook g7. That's the only way to protect from the threats at hand. Right? To give the king an opportunity to come out here. To f7. Uh, so after rook g7, queen h8 check, king f7. And this is the problem with the move f6. Is the rook just simply didn't mean to do that? The rook just simply plays uh rook takes f6 and after the king takes f6, the queen drops. And let's say king f5, queen f8, and again. Then maybe the queen would just come back here again. And so this is why rook d6 is very very strong in this position. And this is why F6, this is why the move F6 is incorrect. For Bronstein to save the game, he has to play F5. And now, let's say white takes here. B takes C3. Then just simply king F7 here. And let's say he tries rook D6 now. Now, white, uh, excuse me, black can protect himself. Rook f4, for example, king e8, queen g5, queen f7, and bishop f1. And again, black is able to hold on and protect himself here. Very interesting uh, position here. Going back again with this variation f5. Let's say if white tries the same idea he did against f6, which is just rook d6. Well, it doesn't work quite the same. Again, rook g7, queen h8, king f7, and let's say rook f6 again. Again, he's not losing the pawn here. And after king takes f6, queen takes e8, and now this rook, this rook can move. Rook c8, and again, position um, very unclear as you have the two rooks of black versus the queen. And you had the bishop and knight versus the rook and bishop. Right, so very imbalanced uh, position here. 
And I think this is very strong Strong position for um for black hair Alright So The last thing I'll say is that F5 was Bronstein's last chance to save the game I mean both players were making mistakes Like I said it seems like time Time pressure or something was was definitely a factor But In this position Again uh, Sabo missed the win Just you know mating three here and All he had to do was play queen f6 He gave Bronstein a chance to save himself with f5 But Bronstein played f6 And even here um, Sabo didn't play the strongest move But he played a move that maintained an advantage So now Rook, or Rook g7 This was uh, Bronstein's last blunder And he played a seemingly normal looking move um, Here he had to just play king f7 uh, right away But here he played Rook g7 first And then Rook d8 Real simple idea Queen d8 and you can see the distance between the king and the queen So this just allows a simple Queen h8 check King f7 Queen uh, takes d8 And then Bronstein you know played a move on adrenal adrenaline And then just uh, resigned uh, So very uh, interesting game Fascinating game uh, I can't say it was like a real good game As far as like the quality of play But it was definitely an exciting game Because it had a lot of ups and downs uh, In the game um, With uh, Bronstein just se seemingly just equalizing Right out of the opening And then just losing um, You know losing his footing After going at the pawn on E2 Which we can say was a, was a correct move it was definitely sound, but again, you know, there's a cost that comes with that. You do have to play accurate when you do stuff like that. So, yes, technically, it was it right for him to take the point? Yes, but he definitely had to play accurate. And it was bold, a bold idea on um, uh, Sabu's part to allow, you know, not just passively defend the pawn with a rook fe1, right? He knew that. He knew that he was at a certain moment in the game where it was time to be dynamic, and he did that. So, a uh, good game by both players. Um, for some of you, that is an introduction to the old Indians. So, you're like, oh, I don't want to play that. Look what happened. But, again, don't judge the game by the result. Look at the opening. Bronstein did uh, equalize rather easily in the opening. It's definitely uh, a system that you should consider when playing the black pieces because you can play against uh d4 you can play it against c4 uh knight f3 pretty much uh anything and also it's a good opening too if you uh don't like playing against the zamish um variation or the Averbach variation of the king's indian um because you can pretty much prevent that uh those systems uh outright so uh, maybe that'll be discussed in a later video This one has been pretty long already So with that said I just want to say thank you for listening Please uh, hit the subscribe button Like button And um, you know please comment uh, below And let me know if there's any uh, pretty uh, other systems Or games that you would like me uh, to discuss And um, please support my channel by checking those links below And I'll see you guys in the next video Thank you